name is Philippe Cousteau, and I am delighted to be participating in the World Preservation Foundation's conference. I'm very sorry not to be able to be there myself. Actually, I actually have a huge affinity and love for the United Kingdom, having spent my uh, university years at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, and a lot of time in London and um, throughout. So uh, very sorry not to be there in person, but delighted nonetheless to be able to participate. Uh, they asked me to talk a little bit about the oceans, and of course the oceans has been part of my life growing up and part of my family's legacy for over three generations. The oceans, uh, uh, for those of us that work in ocean conservation, uh, often feels like they're, they're neglected, to say the least, despite the fact that oceans cover over 70% of this planet, that they are the life support system of this planet. Uh, oftentimes I think people ignore their importance and specifically uh, these days we are seeing massive changes happen in the ocean that are alarming to say the least. We know that climate change is causing elevated sea surface uh, temperatures, uh, it's affecting the melting of the ice caps up in the Arctic, it's uh, uh, affecting currents, um, changing how the Arctic, which essentially the Arctic Ocean is the air conditioning unit of this of this planet. It's radically changing the Arctic. I've been there, I've been diving, I've been drilling the ice, I've been exploring this as an issue for many years. Uh, and the, the Arctic is, is heavily impacted by climate change. But climate change is also affecting currents, climate, um, regional climate, uh, rainfall, uh, weather patterns around the world. But it's not just climate change that is affecting the oceans. Carbon, the other carbon problem as we like to call it, ocean acidification is also one of the greatest potential crises that we face going into the next few decades. Imagine a world where oceans are too acidic. Uh, when oceans absorb carbon, they, they become more acidic. And as the oceans become more acidic and their pH level drops, all the creatures that build shells, creatures like coral reefs or uh, oysters, lobster, um, crabs, shrimp, so many of the creatures that, that we all are familiar with, and of course coral reefs are one of the most biodiverse ecosystems on the entire planet, of which we've lost already 25%. So the big animals, corals and oysters and other things, are unable to extract and, and bind the calcium carbonate molecules in the water column to build their shells. But it's not just the bigger animals like lobster and coral that we're all so familiar with. It's also the smaller animals. Animals like krill, animals like pteropods, free swimming ocean snails that form the basis of oceanic food chains. Our, our models are showing that over the next few decades animals will be unable in some places or will have great difficulty building their shells which of course will lead to um, a collapse of those creatures and, uh, and, and devastation from the bottom, the smallest part of the food chain all the way up to the big beautiful uh, charismatic whales that we all hold so dear. Ocean acidification is a crisis that will be unfolding that we cannot take lightly uh, and is a, is a crisis as, as serious as climate change itself that indeed it is because of our choices that these crises are happening and it's because the unwillingness of global governments to stand up and do what they need to do and do the right thing to control what is a toxic substance that is not just affecting our climate affecting our oceans through ocean acidification and all the compound problems that come from that, from declining fisheries um, that are exacerbated by our overfishing uh, and, the, and the direct human uh, impacts of, of, of shark finning and dynamite fishing and bottom trawling, um, pollution, coastal pollution from, from irresponsible agriculture and deforestation that are decimating the oceans. It's not just these things. I um, grew up with stories from my my grandfather, Jacques Cousteau, and my father, Philippe Cousteau Sr., who spent decades traveling the world, exploring the wonders of our oceans. We went diving down to the coral reefs in the Florida Keys. And we looked at uh, the, the health of the reefs today. We went diving, filmed that. And you know what? To an outsider's point of view, maybe it didn't look that bad. You know, a few fish, some coral, uh, but there were lots of bits of gray and dead, dying rock. And, and when we put that footage side by side with footage from the late 1980s, 
It brings tears to your eyes to see the change that has happened in that time. And that's what we have to remember, is that with the perspective of a few years or even a few decades, we see how the world has changed. But that is the drop in the bucket compared to how much the world has changed over the last 50 to 100 to 150 years. Um, and when I think, when I go back and see places like the Florida Keys in 20 or 30 years have destroyed, when I remember my grandfather's stories diving in the Red Sea in the Mediterranean back in the 1940s and 50s, one of the reasons that he was so inspired to start his campaigns for conservation in the 1960s when they really started to get going. I remember him telling me it was because having been diving there in the 1940s and going back in the 1960s, during that period of time, he saw such a change. He was devastated. And now, if we looked back at the 1960s versus today, the change is stunning even more. So, I urge all of you to understand and to remember the urgency of these issues. As I said, world fish stocks are collapsing. Every year, new species disappear, virtually from a commercial perspective, and in many cases, become extinct. We kill 70 to 100 million sharks a year, primarily for shark fin soup. And that sharks provide an incredibly valuable, pricelessly valuable resource and role in the health of our oceans. And without, without healthy shark populations, entire ecosystems begin to degrade and collapse. Shark populations collapsing. Global fisheries collapsing. 25% of our coral reefs are already gone, with scientists estimate another 25% to disappear by the middle of this century. Coral reefs, any, if anyone in the audience has ever been to a rainforest, coral reefs are amongst the most, if not the most, biodiverse ecosystems on the planet. Now people oftentimes think that it's rainforest. Indeed it is coral reefs. Now though they cover less than 1% of the world's oceans, they are biodiverse places that are vital nurseries for countless species of ocean life. They provide incredible value in protecting coastal communities from storm surge. We know that if the tsunami that happened and devastated and took the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. If that tsunami had encountered healthy coral reefs, countless lives would have been saved. Hundreds of billions of dollars to the global community and global economy would have been saved. We destroy the environment at our own economic, social, humanitarian loss. We know that Katrina in the Gulf of Mexico, a hurricane that decimated New Orleans and the surrounding communities and cost the United States national economy hundreds of billions of dollars. We know that healthy wetlands along the coast of Louisiana, dozens of square miles of which have disappeared in the last few decades, in large part because of channelizing for economic growth, in large part to provide space and area and access to servicing platforms for oil rigs, for economic growth. Well. Those wetlands that have been lost could have absorbed all or most of the storm surge that overwhelmed the dikes and levees of New Orleans, killed thousands of people, ruined the lives of hundreds of thousands of people, and cost this country not only hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars, but an irreplaceable national heritage, and culture, and treasure. That's the cost. The true hard cost to our economies. The true hard cost to global economies that can't afford not to do the right thing in this economic crisis, this global economic crisis that is now being used as an excuse to not act. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to act. We must act and act now. My grandfather had a, a saying, and I'll leave you with this quote from him. And again, thank the World Preservation Foundation and all of you attending this conference for your commitment and dedication to these issues. My grandfather said, we can find happiness in protecting the world around us, not only because we cherish it for its awesome beauty, power, and mystery, but because we cherish our fellow humans, those who live today 
and those who live tomorrow. Human beings who, like ourselves, will increasingly depend on the environment for happiness, health, and life itself. Thank you.